Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Storytellers. Uh, we've got a great episode tonight because we've got the wonderful Dennis Cowan with us tonight. Hi, Dennis. Hello, Graham. What's up, man? <laughs> uh, I, I am doing well. I hope you are. Uh, I, I, I apologize, everybody, because uh, I'm, I'm in pimp mode. If you notice tonight, we, we debuted the new uh, the new countdown trailer that uh, showed Alien Alamo. Uh, so uh, I needed something uh, to promote it during the show. And uh, uh, that's that's what I got. So uh, you're stuck with it from now on. <laughs> So welcome, Denny's. Uh, Thank you. I'm really excited to talk to you about your career and uh, your influences. We're about the same age. Uh, you're born in 61? Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm born in 62. So wow. I'm assuming that our influences are relatively very similar, you know. Probably grew I, up looking at the same kind of comics, same, you know, same genre. Yeah. That whole, you know. Yes. I, you know, when I saw on Wikipedia, I noticed uh, one of the things it said that uh, really influenced you was the Adventures of Superman, the George Reeves show. Yes. Is yes. that is that true? It's one of my it's one of my earliest childhood memories of um of watching that show in black and white uh, when I was living in Queens mm -hmm. with my mom, and you know she just put on the TV, and that was one of the things that was on TV. So I remember seeing that show, seeing George Reeves, seeing Noel Neal, and having vague memories. Like I thought that that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. So what I would do, not knowing kind of what I was doing, is I would draw these boxes representing TV screens, not panels. And I would put the boxes next to one another and draw my own Superman stories like I saw on TV, except I just make up my own. And it was all stick figures and stuff. It wasn't. You know, it was like a stick figure with a cape, triangle cape with an S on it. And I was really doing something. So, um, <laughs> so, so it's sort of early storyboards, really, you know, because you yeah. had the TV screen and you're telling your story pictorially. Yeah. yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. I still probably do things much the same way. But um, <laughs> your drawing <laughs> skills are considerably better. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think there's always, there's always, um, a part of you that's kind of stays that you kind of keep that and never yeah. leave, you know, so I'm still that kid, you know, well, I, yeah, I think that's, that's, um, that's an aspect of people that have longevity in this business is that they, they remember that feeling because, you know, as you know, th th this business can be soul sucking and, and, yeah. and can beat you down. Uh, but if you maintain that level of, of childhood wonderment that you had, uh, you can have a long career because you don't let the other shit get to you. You know, it's, um, you know, since we're talking like two fellow professionals here, um, that's true. That's very true. It's tough to maintain, you know, especially, you know, 40 years or 50 years, however long I've been doing this. Yeah. At the same level of enthusiasm and stuff. And I think you're right. The one thing that's gotten me through is still tapping into that. Every time you sit down, there's a small party that's still that little kid mm -hmm. who wants to tell that story and has to tell that story and is right. compelled to. You know, fortunately, we're in a position now where they're paying us to tell those stories. But, you know, <laughs> Such um, as it is. <laughs> you know, right? But um, but it's... it's um. It's, 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 it takes a lot. It yeah. takes a lot. And without that, I think it would be impossible. I think Do you impossible. find yourself like when, when, when you, when you're feeling that way, uh, let's say you're working on a project that you, you know, you, you got to take cause you got some bills to pay or something like yeah. that. And uh, it's not really in your wheelhouse. You're not loving it and all that kind of stuff. Do you find yourself like going back to those original inspirations, whether it be, you know, Joe Kubert, Jack Kirby, whatever it is, and just just like putting that script away, opening up their work, assuming it, and 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 getting re-energized because that's what I do. I'm always curious if other people do that. You know, I'd be interested in other people's answers to that because, you know, we we're the same age, we're the same guy. You know, so yes, take off your hat and show everybody. See, we're the same guy. We're the same. But it's, it's like Grimoire. Wait, hold on. Hold on, watch this. Wait, because I have these right here. I don't want to like <laughs> not have my glasses on while I, while I talk to you. Um, 
<laughs> De- Dennis just has a better tan than me. That's that's yeah, the only man. difference. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> you know, to, to, to answer that question, I do the same thing. And it doesn't matter whether it's a job that is a pressing deadline or whatever. You find yourself going back to this. I find myself going back to the same sources of inspiration I've always had. You tend to add new ones little by little as you get older sure. because there's not a lot of room. And, you know, if, if I'm letting you in, I, I got to kick somebody else out. So I, I tend to keep my influences. They're pretty much the same as they've always been. And I've drawn constant inspiration. And I'm always and here's the other thing. When you when you have your influences like the Qberts or whoever. You can put their work in front of you. I usually just have one piece. Like I don't look through a lot of comic books and like look at pages. No, no, no. It's usually one panel or one picture of theirs that I'll have on my screen. But you can find so much information sometimes in that one panel or that one page or that one figure. Or sometimes it's just a pencil drawing that your favorite artist did. But you draw so much life from just that, that that can get you through pages. Absolutely. Am, am wrong? I'm right, right? Just pages of stuff. You're like, no, I'm, try- I'm still trying to get that. You know, I'm still trying to capture that. So, yeah, I do, the, I, I do that. But it doesn't matter whether it's, um, whether it's a, a, a job that I'm not particularly inspired by or it's a job that I need. Mm-hmm. I think I need inspiration for all my jobs. So I think I do it. <laughs> you know, I do it constantly. So, yeah. Hey, Dan Frager, thanks for the uh, $4.99. Dan Frager. Yeah. That's my yeah, man. one of his first interviews with you uh, was man. with I you. Dan. I love Dan. What's up, baby? Uh, Dennis, thank you for everything except Detroit. <laughs> Extra thanks for that. <laughs> Only him and I know what that means. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if you feel like sharing, you know, that's fine too. But if not, that that's a private joke, and I got four ninety nine out of it. A private conversation with me and Dan. <laughs> that's cool. That's Great. very cool. <laughs> so, so who are some of those influences that, like, if you're going to um, re-energize, you know, who I, I just threw out Kirby and and, and Kubrick because I know those are a couple of mine. Um, who who are some of yours? Kirby, Kubert, mm-hmm. um, Simonson. Walt Simonson is a big influence on on my art. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking, I look at his stuff constantly, even today. I'm still like trying to achieve one tenth of what he's done. And I can't. One of those guys that as he's aged has not lost a step. In fact, he's gotten better. Yeah, he hasn't lost a step. Nope. I'm constantly thinking, man, am I finally getting that age where I'm just starting to draw shit weird? But Walt is just a constant treasure. So, you know, his work is always in front of me. Um, You know, I love Neil, Neil stuff. Um, my former boss, mm-hmm. you know, I'll always, I'll always love Neil Adams' work. Right. Um, uh, Garcia Lopez. Oh yeah. It's a very big influence on, on, on me. And it has been since the early eighties with Jonah Hex and all that stuff that he used to do. Um, just a huge, huge influence on me. Uh, who else? I like Toth. You know, just to rattle off the American artists that I love, Gil Kane mm-hmm. is a big, big influence on me to this day. You want to talk about artists you can take out if you stuck, if you can't think of anything to draw, if you don't know what to do that day and you are sucking eggs. Right. You don't have things like that, Grant, but I have days like that. No, I, I have days. You're like, I can't do anything. I've completely forgotten how to draw. Why did they even hire me? Um, you could pick up Gil Kane. Put some of Gil's work in front of you. One page of Gil Kane will set you straight. Yeah. If you do nothing else but construct the rest of that page, <laughs> construct your figures on the rest of that page, and do those buildings just like Gil Kane, you'll yeah. get through that page. Yeah. You will get through your page, and you'll get through your next page. So Gil has always been a fallback. Plus, I had the pleasure of meeting Gil. Um, I think I met him a couple of times. Very interesting guy. But one time I met him. Um, Dick Giordano introduced us at one of these comic cons where Dick was introducing me to everybody. Right. It was a very special time. And um, he introduced, he said, Hey, Dennis, this is Gil Kane. Gil Kane is Dennis Cowan. And Gil looked at me 
I said, Dennis Cowan. I said, yeah, he goes, my boy. Called me my boy, so I was done, right? He goes, my boy, I have to tell you. And then he went to this whole long explanation about what he liked about my work. Wow. And my composition and my sense of dynamics. And when I'm, he went through this whole thing, I can't even remember what he said because I'm just looking at him with my mouth open like, first of all, I can't believe Gil can't call me my boy and I'm not mad. And <laughs> secondly, and, and like, in fact, I'm like, you can call me that anytime. And, and then he's complimenting my work, you know? So I was just like, I can't remember anything he said, but I looked at Dick Giordano afterwards. I said, did that just happen? And he said, yeah, that just happened. That was Gil Kane. You know, and he's, he complimented your work. You should, you should, you should treasure that. And I'm like, oh my God. So That's amazing. You know, he knew how much I probably mumbled something to him, like how much he's he influenced me. And you know, if he knew, you know, how much he an effect he had on me, he would have just been maybe he would have taken a compliment back because I was just ripping him off. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, had a, I had a similar uh, uh, incident with uh, John Ramita. Really? Yeah. When I first met him, I met him at a convention and uh, uh, I was at the DC booth signing stuff. And then Chuck Dixon came up to me and said, hey, uh, Ramita just sat down at his table. And I'm like, oh, really? Oh, geez. So I excused myself. I got up from the DC table and went over there and I stood in line with everybody else. And I stuck my hand out when it was finally my turn. I introduced myself. And before I could get anything out, he goes, Graham Nolan, the artist? I said, yeah. And he says, I really loved your Batman, uh, your Batman Spider-Man book. And I had done that in specifically uh -huh. all the Batman characters I drew in my style, all the Spider-Man characters I drew in Ramita's style. And Amazing. he saw it and, and, and you know, it had the Kingpin in it and, and all that stuff. And, and, uh, and he saw it and he really liked it and, and told me so. And I was like, uh, okay, I can die. I can retire now. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, Stuff like that from our our um, they're not our peers, but you know the people that we looked up to, our heroes. So yeah. When I was at Marvel, um, I was never a Romita Raider. I started at Marvel when I was like twenty or nineteen or something, but I had already I was already working on books. Oh, nice. You know, I managed to not not manage. I would have happened to be a Romita Raider. I probably missed out on so much, but I would always be over there watching those guys. And I think I confused John. Like, he didn't know whether, are you a Romita Raider? Like, why are you around? Why are you hanging around? <laughs> why are you hanging around here? <laughs> I would just look over, like, these dudes' desk and look at what John was doing. He was always looking over his shoulder at me, like, you know, because you're irritating. So look up at me, like, you still here? And I'm just there looking, you know. I think I did that to Neil Adams, too, a bunch of times. I'll bet. He would turn around and look at me just standing there staring at his hands. Like, why are you still standing here? <laughs> Like, I'm hoping to learn something from the yeah, way you hold the yeah, pencil, maybe. You yeah, know? Anything. Give me some of that magic, man. Yeah. 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 It, it, yeah no, I not, and, then, and then his son, and then JR comes along while I'm at Marvel, and he's taking over X Men, right? It's like 80 something. Oh. And I just remember being so jealous. <laughs> like, not only is John Romita Jr., I mean, John Romita is great, but he has a son. And his son was great. Why couldn't I be like John? Why couldn't I have been John Romita Jr.'s kid? Like, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Romita Jr. is awesome, dude. I, I had him on one of my shows a few yeah. weeks ago. He's so uh, great. Actually, a couple months ago. He's so great. He I really is. Him. He's a real cool guy. His art, he's one of those people that I look at, and I study his work, and I yeah. look at him trying to get some of what he has. Um, consummate storyteller, consummate artist. Yeah, it, his storytelling is one of the best in the business. I mean, because he doesn't have to flower it up with panel arrangements or anything. He can do six panel grids, yeah. and everything is in there. You, it, it immerses you into the story, which is one of the tenets that I'm always preaching: is is that you have to have clarity, dynamics, and immersion. Uh, well, we were taught all of us the same way, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you're old old school, what they call it. I know um, JR was taught that way. Yeah. I know he was taught that way. That's the way I was taught. You mm -hmm. know, that's what Denny taught me and Carmine Infantino going over my stuff and cursing me out and Joe Orlando go over my stuff and handing it back and making me do it over and over again. 
That's about as old school as you can get. And none of them ever said anything about, let's do some odd shaped panels with, with figures sticking out of it and mm -hmm. do some bizarre stuff to draw attention to this one. No, no, none, none of them ever said that. They always said, if you can't tell this story in a square panel and six in one square grid, if you can't tell the story like that, you're not a storyteller. Mm. Why are you here? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. You know? Meanwhile, Neil is like, ah, screw that. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> right. But the thing with Neil, right, is that he knew all those rules. He right. knew those rules back and forth. He was doing Ben Casey and doing all that stuff while we weren't even thinking about doing any of that. So he'd already right. gone through all that, that those right. restrictions, right? Mm -hmm. So when he gets the comments, he's like, world is mine. And it was. And it was. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. but I he was not. At, I think it's freedom. freedom. You know, right. he had all this real estate to work in now, as opposed to the the, the newspaper strips. Right, instead of this, you know, confined thing. So, you know, it, it was different for him. But for us, you know, or at least for me, I, I was taught a different way. Even though yeah. I worked with Neil, Neil never said do crazy panel layouts like me. Right. He said, he said tell the story. Yeah. You know, then we'll worry about all that other stuff. Thank you, Eric McIntyre. Denny's great to see you here. I loved Milestone as a kid, specifically Icon and Rocket and Hardware. But I wanted to ask you, will you, we see any of the Milestone roster on the silver screen? That's a good question. Um, well, if you've read any of the headlines, um, you know, especially the ones that came out in the last year or so, you'll know that Michael B. Jordan and um, Reggie and I are doing Static Shock live action movie. So, yeah, yeah. So that's being worked on now. I mean, it's in development. There's a there's a writer attached to it, Randy McKinnon, who's writing a screenplay now. So we're, we're doing it. As far as the other characters are concerned, I can't talk about all the stuff that we've been talking to people about. Nice. Um, but it's been, to say there's been a lot of interest would be an understatement. You can say that. There's Fantastic. Been a lot of and and the things that we're doing and bringing these characters to 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 live action and 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 you know animation and all all kinds of other stuff. So, well, I mean, having a, a star like Michael B. Jordan attached to a project is always you know something that's going to push it over the top. You know, they look for a director or a star right. because right. financing. You know, uh, that's how it works in Hollywood. Right. To that's your money. way. Of yeah, yeah, that's you know they hate risk. <laughs> it's right. like, yeah, man, you know, there's so much money involved. You can't you can't blame people. You know, it's like sure. I, I get it, I get it. Mm -hmm. So, but having him attached is, has been um, has been great. You know, he's um, he's a big old movie star. So absolutely, you, know, I, you can't you can't you can't go wrong with that. And he's very passionate about static and all things milestone. And you know, of course, you have Reggie Hudlin on it and myself. So it's in safe hands. It's in good hands. So let's talk a little bit about Milestone and, and how that um, how, how that line got started. Milestone was started in 1992. And um, it was originally an idea of mine um, that I had uh, to, to, to bring together a group of creators to create a group of characters of color who had been unrepresented, unrepresented in comics up to that point. There were no characters like Static or Icon or Hardware in comics. Mm -hmm. um, that was a serious void to me. And at that point in the 90s, I'd already been doing comics for like 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. So I had a pretty good idea of what was out and what was. And I had worked on Black Panther. I worked on Luke Cage. That covered two of them. That was about it. Mm -hmm. you no, know, there was Blade and now right <laughs> or somebody like that from the teen titans right like there wasn't a whole lot of black characters yeah. going on it's like yeah. now it's the black, black lightning that was one there was black lightning there was black lightning done by my pal trevor so you know there was there was that stuff going on but there weren't a whole lot right and right. um what we wanted to do was change that so i called Dwayne mcduffie called michael davis we got together with Derek Dingle, my childhood buddy, who was running Black Enterprise at the time. And um, um, Christopher Priest, Jim Owsley, was there at the very beginning, helping us with all this stuff, though he doesn't like to take any credit for anything. Um, he, was, he was there uh, a lot. 
And we just basically got together and decided, you know, I tried to convince them that this is a good idea. Let's get together and create these characters full of young enthusiasm, you know, with 30 and 29. So we're going to really get this done. And um, um, I had to convince them to do it. They thought I was crazy. They really did. Dwayne's like, you're nuts. This will never work. But I'll sign up because I, I like you and you're crazy. They all said the same thing. Um, but Dwayne subtly changed my, my intent. My intent was to do, well, we're black, so we'll do black comics with just black characters and see how that goes. But Dwayne's vision was a little bit more expansive than that. And he was like, if we're going to do this, we have to represent people who are underrepresented in comics. So whether that's gay, other minority characters, transgender characters, whatever we're doing, let's encompass all of that which was a scary thing to step into in 1992. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also a, a necessary move for us. So we just went and did it. And um, came out of the box with Static and Icon and Rocket and Blood Syndicate and Hardware and, you know, expanded the line from there. We had a good five-year run. Mm -hmm. it imploded. You know, a lot of things happened. Um, and Milestone you know, we, we couldn't publish comic books anymore. Uh, so. Now, that was, was Milestone a, under under Marvel? Milestone was not under anybody. Milestone's an independent company. We had a deal with DC Comics. Okay, okay. We distributed and published our comic books. Okay. Um, but DC at no point ever owned Milestone or had a mistake in our company or whatever. What we did have, though, was a dependency on DC's finances. And you know their financial network to make Milestone run because at the time they were our sole client, and it took everything we had to do all those books for it, for publication. So it was by DC, DC financing the pay, uh, the page rates and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. yeah. yeah, that was that was they were paying us. They were paying us to do these books, um, while we retain uh, certain rights to the characters and. To the art and to a lot of the stuff, they also had certain rights, but right. they paid us. That was part of the deal. They paid us to produce these books. Okay. And that's what we did. Okay. Okay. The like packager, in a way. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Like the old studios, like those old binder Eisner studios. With yeah. The packages. Eisner, Iger, and uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's kind of like that. Lev Gleason and <laughs> yes, all that stuff that you read about in Stamenko's history of comics and went, yeah, you can only be one of those guys. <laughs> I'm gonna work for those guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think about uh, uh, because you guys broke ground uh, with Milestone as far as making characters? You well, you did it the right way. You created brand new characters to to fill voids of underrepresented people. Uh, right. What do you think about when Marvel and DC uh, uh, race or gender swap or uh, uh, sexual identity swap characters that are pre-existing characters uh, basically just pandering? You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. Because I know, and because I've been personally involved with the creation of lots of new characters, mm -hmm. you know, I know that nothing beats creating new characters um, out of whole cloth if you can, out of scratch if you can. Um, you know, we got tremendous value out of doing that. It doesn't mean that our characters weren't based on archetypes. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, Static is based on like a Spider-Man archetype. You know, hardware is like kind of an Iron Man kind of archetype, you know, mm -hmm. Iron and Rocket, you know, it's like Superman and Robin, mm -hmm. you know, like there's, those are the archetypes. Um, as far as taking someone like Superman and making him black or making Batman black or something like that. Right. I can see the value in it, you know, Graham, for, for, for people. It just exposes a different part of the characters to different people. Okay, that that's cool. I'm not so much in favor of doing it um, because I don't think there's a, for me personally, there isn't a need to. You know, I can just create new characters. For other people, 
who haven't been exposed to some of these characters before. Not everyone knows Superman, not everyone knows Batman, we just think they do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't even read comic books now. We just think they do, but they do not. A lot of people just say, I'll wait for the movie. I'll go see that Avengers movie. I read that Avengers comic book. I'll see that Captain America movie. I'm not looking at that comic, that comic book. So anything to get them to go, wait, hold on, something's going on in comics that I should check out? That's not a bad thing at all. Mm-hmm. If that's a good thing, you know. If if there's a black Batman and that makes me want to go out and buy Batman now, fine. Fine. Go out and buy Batman, you know, and then check out all the other Batman titles that are there and check out all the Superman because there's a whole world waiting for you. It's not just this black Batman or this black Superman character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Personally, I don't need to do it. I see the value in it. Mm-hmm. Other people doing it just for that reason alone. Um, as far as the pandering aspect of it and, and all that kind of stuff, who are you pandering to? You know, I don't know what that what that what that means. Um, I don't uh, you know, I don't I don't know what that audience is being. Pan- I don't know what that is. Uh, but I mean, that's that's my thoughts. I always much rather have original characters. Right you now. Now, that being said is Into the Spider-Verse, which was a brilliant effing movie mm-hmm. with a brilliant Miles Morales kind of character right. that was inspired by Static. Oh. Who was inspired by Spider-Man, yes, yes. Interesting. Is that, is that, you know, is that pandering? You know, is that, you know, that's a black Spider-Man. Is that, no. Mm-hmm. Great character all on his own. They made it unique, just as great. Does not take away from Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Peter Parker, the man. You know, right. it's in addition to. So I don't think people should get too twisted up coming from experience in this stuff mm-hmm. on what's going on, You're right. on, on what's happening with Batman. Lately. I would say, relax. The other Batman's still here. He ain't going nowhere. Trust me, Warner Brothers ain't letting him go nowhere. Right. And he ain't letting Superman go nowhere. That's going to be Henry Cavill or whoever it's going to be. If they have an additional Michael Jordan as Superman, what are they going to end? You still have both. You know, it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's all good. But right. again, you know, I don't having having been someone who creates this stuff for real. Right. Right. I can be like maybe I can I can afford to be like that. Like ah, let's just create our own. I need that shit. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to trying to have you know compassion and, and an understanding for the other side too. Right. So that, that's kind of where I stand on that. That's that was a long explanation, but. That, well, no, I, I, uh, I appreciate it. I think that's a, a wonderful and thoughtful explanation. Mm-hmm. Um, when I use the word pandering, um, what I meant by that was that um, we're talking about corporations. Sure. And uh, all they give a shit about is the bottom dollar, the bottom line. Uh, know, they right? don't care about really bringing in new readers or, or, or readers of color. If, if they did, they would do the heavy lifting of creating new characters that they could, uh, l- like you did, reach an audience um, uh, on a visceral level to create, to, to swap somebody or to, to, it just seems like an easy way out for me. Yeah, it that, feels like lazy thinking is what you say. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm getting to is it, it feels like lazy thinking that they don't want to do the heavy work of creating, like when Stan and Jack came up with the Black Panther. Okay. Sure. Okay. So his name is Black Panther, but it, but it tied in with the social conscience of the time in the sixties because of the Black Panther movement. And the, right. that was smart bit of, of, right. of uh, uh, marketing there, right. but they created a character out of whole cloth with a, a universe and, and a kingdom and, and, and gave him the, the super scientific powers and powers. They, they, they did the heavy lifting and created a great character that people could relate to people of color in the sixties and really look up to, they didn't take another character and make it something else. And, and that's the kind of stuff that bothers me today is that, they don't, they're unwilling to, or they're too lazy to make a character. Let's say you're going to do a, a gay character too. Okay. Don't define that character. His main defining thing is his gayness. Make that an aspect of his character. Just like 
heterosexuality is an aspect of who I am. It's not the entirety of me, you know? Uh, it's just that kind of laziness, I think, that that uh, editorial and creators have uh, at the big two these days instead of doing the heavy work. It's uh, it's 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 definitely. I can see I can see what you're saying, but let's put it this way: um, as far as DC is concerned, I can't speak for Marvel because I don't do not not much for Marvel. As far as DC is concerned, they put in as of now, and I I know this personally. Mm-hmm. Tremendous amount of money, tremendous amount of effort, um, and commitment. You know, Jim Lee, um, uh, the, the new boss, the new boss there, Don Cherry, um, all Pam Lifford, all the people there have made a, a tremendous effort in bringing these milestone characters, which are original characters, back into publication back in front of people back mm-hmm. to DC, you know uh there's no there's no pandering or race bending or anything involved with their commitment with milestone right you, you know so i think that they do care about all this stuff because personally i'm talking to them every day mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm with them i'm talking to jim lee we're getting this stuff we're planning about what we're going to do how do we get this stuff out to people how do we reach people we're talking to don cherry about outreach programs and what reggie and i can do so i know their commitment to this stuff is is real it's not bs it's not lip service they do care good um, about about this stuff and the, the evidence is milestone it's not an accident you know as you know these things are not cheap to do <laughs> comics aren't cheap to do they may be the cheapest form of entertainment and still doesn't make them cheap to do. Yeah. So DC has poured a lot of money into making sure that these books are true to themselves and have the right kind of voice. And more importantly, um, Graham, they've never tried to censor us in any kind of way about anything we want to talk about. Outstanding. So, yeah, no, it's been, it's been excellent. Chris Conroy has been our editor on it. Uh, Marquise uh, Draper and 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 the team there have been great. So I I can speak for DC's commitment to 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 this stuff. It's real. It's real. It's not lip service. That's great. Um, if it was lip service. They certainly wouldn't be involved with Reggie and I and Milestone because mm-hmm. we're not about we're not about that 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 nonsense. Right, because you guys did it the hard way, the old fashioned way. You know, you, your your time and effort on the line, your yeah. careers on the line, and you you created characters that were resonating with people, and, and which is why the characters resonate to this day. You know, mm-hmm. which is why people are excited about Static and Hard right. and, and Rocket because they had a very solid, very solid structure and base mm-hmm. and. They were original characters to bring you right. back to the original point. So mm-hmm. that resonates now. Will the Black Batman 50 years from now or 30 years from now have that same resonance with people? Will mm-hmm. people grow up going, you know what? When I was a kid, they brought out that Black Batman. And boy, I can't wait to see him again. Now that I'm an adult and I have my own kids, I want them to be. I don't know if it's going to be like that. Right. right. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to be like that for, for, for those kind of characters. Or for the black for the black Superman or anything like that. I drew right. a black Superman story, um, Val Zod or, or whoever he is. It was a lot of fun. I just remember thinking, "What is this?" <laughs> I, I was drawing. I'm going, "This is cool, but what is it? What, what am I drawing?" And I just had that really strange. I'm like, "Why, why am I not just drawing icon?" And <laughs> <laughs> it was really strange. But um, you know, it was it was all good. So yeah. So when when Milestone um, stopped publishing, yes, uh, did you get out of comics at that point? Is that is that when you went into um, uh, animation? Yeah, I mean, I've never stopped doing comics at any point, really. Maybe I took a year and didn't do anything, or a couple of years and really didn't do anything major. But I've always done done comics. When Milestone ceased publication. I was at I was already at Motown, and I was working as a senior VP at Motown. Um, in charge, they had a small animation department, and I was in charge of that. So I was doing a lot of not comic book stuff. I was true. I was doing a lot of animation, but more the creative 
exec side than doing any actual animating. I'm not an animator. You know, I just love working with animation professionals who are awesome. Right. Doing shows. You know, how, so. how, how did you land that job? I mean, uh, was that something I you were asked? asked or? Yeah, I was asked. I was asked. Um, um, Clarence Avant. Actually, Gerald Busby was running Motown at the time. He had hired Michael Davis. And Michael asked me to come on over to Motown and work with him in Motown. And I'm like, oh, man, I, I don't know. So he says, no, 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 come and meet, come, come work with us at Motown. We'll see. So I flew to L.A., met with Gerald. They offered me the job. I flew back home. I'm going to Motown. I'm going to work in Motown, California. Uh, we'll move everyone out. M went, went back to L.A. When I got back to L.A., they had fired Gerald. Oh. <laughs> you know, it was a new boss, Clarence Avant, who fortunately liked Michael and liked me and kept me on, you know. So um, I ended up working for Motown for like a year or two years or something like that, um, just developing shows with them and hanging out with all the Motown people. Met Stevie Wonder, met Mary Wilson, really did all that stuff. Wow. All the parties did really, you know, it was Motown. It was great. Barry Gordy? Did you meet Barry Gordy? I met Barry Gordy. Yes. <laughs> I did meet Barry Gordy. That was one of the first meetings I had was with Barry Gordy. I was great at job. Washington, D.C. We were going, I don't know. Why, why we were there, I didn't meet Obama or anything. I was just at Washington, D.C. having to do some business, and I met Gerald. I met, I met, um, I met, I met him there, so. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. That's really I'm cool. So, so, so we, did you live there for that, uh, that time uh, when you were at Motown? And did you I lived in L.A. because Motown was in L.A. at the time. So okay. Yeah, I was okay. living in L.A. That's when and I then, moved in, in 96. But you were at BET, too. I was at BET after that. Okay. Um, yeah, there was about like a maybe a year between uh, Motown and that. I think I worked for Nickelodeon oh. for a brief period of time. And I did a bunch of stuff. Um, by the time BET rolled around, that was after Static. That was after all that stuff. So from from Motown, I went to from Motown. I went to Nickelodeon and was doing storyboard revisions and stuff like that. So I went from an executive job to an art job and also doing comic books, more comic books and, and stuff. And while at Nickelodeon, I got the call from Warner Brothers about how they were gonna pitch a show called Static and wanted to know if I wanted to be involved in that. So I went and met with Alan Burnett, oh. who um, was the genius producer um, behind so many, you know, Batman and all kinds of stuff over at Warner Brothers. And he told me that he loved Static and that he had pitched Kids WB with one line and that they were interested and wanted to meet with me and him. And I said, well, what was the line? He said, I just told him, I told executives of Kids WB, I want to do a show. It's called Static. It's Chris Rock at 14 with superpowers. <laughs> Real yunt. Huh. Yeah, right, right, right. Wow, you saw the whole thing. You saw the whole thing, and they saw the whole thing. You talk so, about an elevator pitch, right? Oh my <laughs> god, mine. So we went, and um, you know, I went and met with the Warner Brothers executives, and they asked me about Static, and I told them who the character was and what he did, and you know, who he, what he was about, and how he was a character it was about action, not violence. You know. Um, how his fist never really solved the problem. Like just all the things that, that went into Virgil's personality. He was always the light in the room, never darkness. Um, his, his presence was effervescent, not, never like just his parents, like the whole thing. And at the end of that pitch, they wanted to do the show. So suddenly I wasn't working at Nickelodeon anymore. Now I'm on static shock. And, and you know, two years or three years of that, however long we, we managed to make it work. So that's, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. So I, I assume you guys, you as a creators, you the, the show had royalties for you, right? Because you owned it. I did not own Static Shock the show. Warner Brothers owned Static Shock the show. I, you know, have a percentage of the character. It's Milestone has a percentage of all the characters. So we got compensated, you know, for for all the uses of static and sure. still do. You know, um, every time they use it, they, they got to cut a check. 
So right. it's always good. It's always good. <laughs> That's fantastic. Wow. So um, what are you working on now? I mean, uh, obviously the Milestone characters have come back and it's under the Icon banner. Is that correct? No. The, the Milestone characters have come back under the Milestone banner. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Reggie and I and Derek Dingle um, and I are bringing these characters really, you know, Re Derek handles a lot of the business stuff, but Reggie and I are really the creative forces and producers behind these books. Um, it's under Milestone. We're doing them with DC. As I mentioned before, Chris Conroy is our editor. Yeah. It's hardware, static, um, icon and rocket, and a third title, which people may be able to guess, but I can't say what it is right now but it's one that people have been asking for. Um, we're doing these books now. I'm drawing hardware with Bill Sienkiewicz. Nice. Bill, yeah, Bill and I are, are working on hardware. Um, you guys are an awesome team together. Oh, man, you're, so, you're so nice. Uh, Bill, Bill's incredible. Well, like, so are you. Uh, but but uh, you know, the, to, the two of you marrying your styles together, they're so simpatico. No. Uh, like Bill has inked me uh, on Detective Comics uh, years ago, and it, it – it looks more like Bill than me. Uh, whereas when Bill inks you, it still looks like you because you, when your your pencils are very similar to how how Bill inks, you know, I think that mm -hmm. that simpatico is fantastic. Yeah, well, um, it's also you know Bill's been inking. Bill's been working with me since 1980 something. So, you know, we've been. I remember. You know how I met Bill Sienkiewicz? I'll tell you the story real quick. Here's how I met Bill Sienkiewicz. I'm up at DC already, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, I'm working. I was Rich Buckler's assistant, and oh, wow. so I would go up to yeah. You know, I work for Rich, so I'd always go. He'd always bring me up to DC when he had to deliver pages, or whatever. So I'm just kind of hanging out, and um, I'm in the front lobby. I think this is when they had Superman sitting there in the front lobby. Oh yeah, and I remember that. That reading, reading the paper, right? So I'm sitting on the couch. Superman's over there. I'm sitting on the couch, just chilling. And I see this guy come in and he's wearing a sports jacket. I'll never forget it's like a plaid sports jacket or something and slacks and a big portfolio. It's white dude. He walks in and he's got all this energy and stuff and he has to see somebody. And then he gets ushered. I'm just sitting in the front. So I could have gone in the back in the front, whatever I wanted. But I just watched this guy try to get in. And oh, he had an appointment with, he had an appointment with, I think it was Dick Giordano or somebody or whoever. So he went in and I remember thinking, wow, this dude's in a suit with his portfolio. Like, who, what kind of job does he think he's going to try to get? He's in comics, baby. We don't wear no <laughs> suit. So um, later on, I'm working for Neil Adams. And from like this, from Rich, I probably went right to Neil. And I'm working for Neil. And I look up, and that guy is walking in Neil's studio, that same guy. And he walks past me. I think he's wearing the same jacket because it must be a professional visit. And, and he opens his portfolio and he shows Neil his work. It was Bill. And Neil is looking at Bill's pages. And he's flipping through the portfolio. Where all his little Neil gremlins are in the front room working for Neil. I'm at a desk trying desperately to color comps or whatever I was trying to do, messing everything up. Neil says, hey, everybody, come over here and look at this. So he makes us all get up to come over and look at Bill Sienkiewicz's portfolio. He's including Mike Nasser, because Mike Nasser was there. Okay. He's flipping through the pages. He says, see, Bill Sienkiewicz is doing me, but he's doing it right. And he just looked at all of us little copycats who wasn't doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> and what I did, kept flipping, he says, yeah, this is, this is really good. This is really good. So... He closes the book at the spill. It doesn't say anything. He said, I think he was like a little embarrassed. Neil has smoked all of us, all of us, like just we ain't nothing. So, we, you know, I go sit back at my little desk and I'm just looking at this wonderful artist's portfolio, which is now closed. And Neil's walking it over to his desk. Neil picks up the phone. And I don't know whether he talked to the secretary or whatever, but he says, get Jim Shooter on the phone. He gets Jim Shooter on the phone and says, hey, Jim, this is Neil. I'm sending over someone that you're going to want to see. Yeah, his name is, wait, what's your name? Bill Sinkev, 
Sinkevich. Sinkevich. You need to look at his portfolio because he's really good. Yeah, I'm sending him over right now. Bam. No shit. No shit. Bill walked over. I think Bill walked right over to Marvel after that. Next thing I know, he's doing Moon Knight. Wow. <laughs> he was doing Moon Knight. And I think I, I, I was over at Marvel dinking around, trying to do White Tiger backups or whatever they were having me do. And I think I got a Hulk pinup or something. Like, he was already doing major stuff, and I'm, like, dinking along. But I've known, I've known Bill almost from the time he showed up at D.C., like the first time. And, you know, we ended up hitting it off. But like the next time I saw him, I probably ended up talking to him. And we just became very fast friends from the minute we saw each other. And um, not, not I'm talking a lot, but if you go on Twitter, you'll see on my, on, my, on my feed, Jim Shooter put up an announcement. It was so nice. And I didn't realize he had done it. In 1980 or 1981, he put up an announcement. Dennis Cowan, 20 years old. We've just signed Dennis to an exclusive contract at Marvel. Dennis is a martial arts expert and blah, blah, blah. Him, along with his friend, 24-year-old Bill Sienkiewicz, are sure to set the world, the art world on fire someday. <laughs> no pressure. Right? 40 years later, here we are, still here. I don't set know. The I world on fire. Bill did. Bill set the world on fire. Oh, please. You're, oh. you're, you're, you're too much. You know. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you guys in the chat room, you know, this, this guy's a modest guy. He, he is, uh, no. he's up there with, with the tops, you know, I but, uh, you know, when we're talking about your influences too, yeah. one guy that didn't get mentioned, which I see in your work is Topi. Because I didn't get a chance to talk about my European influences because I talked ah. so much. Um, Topi is a huge influence on me. Like he is on Walt Simonson, like mm -hmm. he is on. You know, if you look at Walt's stuff, you're looking at a lot of Topi. Mm -hmm. You look at, if you look at Bill's stuff, you're looking at Topi. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're looking at my stuff, you're definitely looking at at Topi. So many artists are are influenced by him. Jorge Zafino was influenced by him. His son is influenced by him. Um, just, just, just a wonderful artist. Dino Battaglia is another Italian Italian artist whose work I just adore. Mm -hmm. Like. Cannot get enough of it. Paul Guillaume is a French artist. Yep, yep. He's a master. A ma just as good as any of the American artists I'm talking about, except they were influenced by American artists. So, you know, we, they, they didn't influence, they didn't make this up, we did. Mm -hmm. You know, they came over to us and got it from us. So, uh, uh, Topi, Battaglia, Guillaume, there's so many others. I mentioned Breccia. Breccia is another one who's just, Mm -hmm. Or Brett, how, how you pronounce his name? Yeah, um, huge influence on me. Huge influence on me. Um, I've had the fortune of meeting some of these people, and and um, had had transformative experiences. You know, so oh, so, yeah, yeah. So so yeah, those those European European artists are are huge, huge Italian artists. All those guys, they yeah. just know. How comics and know how to do them right so that's work that's in front of me all the time yeah you know it's just it's just it's just excellent i would check i would urge anyone to check out their stuff i don't know do you, you probably look at their stuff oh you sure sure I, i've got books of bernay up yes, there bernay's, uh, one, right? bernay's a genius genius mm -hmm. yeah genius. It, genius. It, it, it's almost like he takes the brush dips it in ink and just draws you know and i love that organic looseness that he has um, him, and him, him, and, and um, Zafino. Mm -hmm. I have some originals of Zafino. Oh, you do? Which ones you got? I've got uh, I got one from the Punisher, a uh, graphic novel that he did, and I, I got, got one from Inner World. I got two pages from that. Do you? I got two pages from that. I have oil paintings from him. I have seven block character oh. sketches from him. Yeah, seven block. You know how I got them. Chuck Dixon. No. No? No, I got them from um, Jorge Zafino while he was alive. Ah. He traded artwork with me. Nice. It was incredible. We, we just hung out. He didn't speak much English. I didn't speak any Spanish. But when we met, we connected. So I invited him over to my house. 
uh, my apartment in, in Manhattan at the time when he was visiting New York. He came over with his wife and his translator. And um, Ariel, I think his translator's name was. So they came over the house. We had wine, food, cheese, drink. And then the portfolios came out. Nice. So he brings out his portfolio. He opens it up. And he says, pick whatever you like. I said, what? He said, pick, because man, we have been bonding seriously. He said, pick whatever you like. I'm like, oh my God. So I picked two Punisher pages. I picked seven blocks. I picked an oil painting. I picked a bunch of stuff. I had like six or seven pieces. I'm like, are, are these okay? You sure? He's like, yeah. He goes, under one condition. I said, what? He goes, I get to choose from your work. So he opened my, like in my, my house. So he opens up my, my, my drawer, my flatbed and takes seven pieces of mine that he liked. And we traded. Nice. And I was just like, I couldn't believe he wanted anything of mine. <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting it. Well, first of all, you take the stuff from me that I copied off of you. But <laughs> you feel, feel, feel free to take it. Yeah. Um, uh, that was like a magical. And I didn't get it from Chuck Dixon. I got it from Jorge Zafino himself. That's very cool. I just treasure them to this day. Yeah. Are, 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 are his um it, he he did like uh his pages were on like bond paper it's like yeah. the shittiest paper you could yeah. possibly get yeah uh, I, I was just fascinated by that you know it's like yeah. all beat up and then yeah. he puts a ton of white out and razor scrapes on it and everything and he did everything he was so great yeah just painting on top of black and pulling out those highlights and yes all that stuff that Tove did except he took it he was kind of like Tove combined with Qbert with some other stuff in it that you ain't never seen. And he was just the perfect artist for us when he came out. Yeah. yeah All that he, really world, it stuff, he was just like, I know I wanted to draw like that. So yeah. Yeah. It was, it was transforming it. Yeah. I, I knew I could never draw like that. So <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, right? I was I, very happy to, to, to live vicariously through the artwork that I could see, yeah. you know, I miss his son. About, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, just, there's something about holding the artwork and and feeling it and feeling the uh, the raised ink or the uh, uh, the the pen uh, dipping into the paper and and that kind of stuff. I just I love that that tactile aspect of of this feeling when you have original art from someone, especially someone you love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You hold a piece of them, you know, because they physically put this mark on this paper. They physically dip right. that ink. They yeah. physically did it. Their essence is in that page. Yeah. And, and everything so, you see is a decision. Yes. Because yes. it's a white piece of paper like everybody else has. It's blank. Everything that went on there was a conscious decision. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's, yes. that's, that's, that's magical. magical. Oh, yes. So, no, I, 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 I totally get it. Totally <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he, he, you know, I remember when we were at uh, in Dallas together at that uh, North Dallas uh, Comic Con, uh, mm -hmm. we were taking that uh, uh, little bus out to to have um, uh, barbecue, Texas barbecue. Yeah, yeah and we started we started talking about Jim Apparel, and uh, the, the two of us were going on like a couple of old hens about how you know just how great Jim Apparel was and and, and, and stuff. Um, and I just did a show last week uh, on Jim Apparel. Really? Yeah, yeah. I right. just I, I needed to to cover his work and stuff. And so uh, having you next, it, it made me made, made me think of that that uh, that incident. Jim Apparel. I have to say, Jim Apparel is probably a bigger influence on me than Neil. Even though Neil was huge for me, Jim Apparel. Jim Apparel's comics taught you how to do comics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Out economics. He didn't do a lot of fancy panel layout, though. He did some mm -hmm. triangle panels and stuff like that. Right. But most of this stuff took place within the panel. But mm -hmm. the way he drew Batman and the way he drew physical action and the way his characters were planted, mm -hmm. the fact that he pencil inked, lettered everything, one yeah. page a day, page a day. Just the balance, just the way, and you could see his work evolve. Mm -hmm. Being that advertising kind of scratchy, then all of a sudden he discovers Neil Adams and Mill Kniff at the same time. 
and just right. kind of binds that together. Exactly, you know? exactly. He right. married the two, right? Two great that styles with that advertising art, with that newspaper, just the things he did. He drew that. The way it's funny too, because he drew nothing like he looked. No, my, no. my appearance. I thought Jim Apparel was going to be this tall, thin, white dude. You know, black hair. You know, wiry, like thin suit. I knew. I just knew that's what Jim Apparel looked like, right? Because that's what he drew. I met him, and he was like this little guy, kind of you know, small, big glasses, big glasses, big eyes, big ears. You know, like looking nothing like I thought he would look. Yeah. I sat next to him at a dinner, a cartoonist dinner, and I couldn't even speak to him. So. I was so in awe. I was, <laughs> a power, I can't even speak. I just watched him eat. <laughs> but um, I figured um, Jim Apparel must have had like, the biggest freaking forearms ever because I always remember that Brave and Bold where Batman and Wildcat met. Yes. And uh, it was one from like 72, 7, 1973 yes. when he was at like the peak of his powers. And there's this this shot of Ted, Ted, is it Ted? Ted Cord, or I can't remember what what uh, yeah. what his name is, but he's working the speed bag, and yes. it's, and he's up like this. He's like, Brr, and he's got these freaking massive hairy forearms and stuff. And I was like, oh my god! And then when when Jim Apparel th drew a punch, I mean, it's only Kirby had more power in a punch. Than Kyle that. Baker and I were talking about that one day a no long kidding. time. Ago. Kyle Baker and I, because Jim Apparel is one of his favorite artists. Like, if you're an artist, artist. Jim Apparel is going to be your guy, you know, and um, Fred Grant, thank you. Grant, that's right. <laughs> and um, um, he was talking about the visceral power of of Jim Apparel. And one of the things I still try to get to this day is that when his characters hit somebody or punch somebody, you're right. Other than Kirby, he's the only one who ever made you feel like, God damn, that shit must have hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So and suck like the muscle. That cat lost a tooth on that punch. Yes. And like when he fought when 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 Batman fought Wildcat, I was like, fuck. Like I did you Wildcat. Oh, that one with like the Wildcat. Joker with when they've got the, the Roman wraps on them. Yeah, yeah, rap, yeah. Yes. All that stuff. Like I said, that showed us how to do comics. If if our comics weren't like that, we weren't drawing no real comics. That's yeah, how I felt. Yeah, like yeah. my comics didn't have that kind of. And the thing with a, uh, someone like Jim Aparo is that you got an emotional, an emotional feeling from it, far mm -hmm. more than being dazzled physically. I mean, dazzled um, technically. You got an emotional, visceral feeling like you got from Kirby, just like right. It's the shit. Like yeah. how can anyone know that? You know. Well, well let, let's really put this in perspective. There's yeah. two guys that are sixty years old. And there was a dude 45 years ago sitting at a table with a blank piece of paper making drawings. And now, 45 years later, two 60-year-old guys are like kids talking about what those little drawings meant to them. Yes. I mean, yes. that really encapsulates what this shit's about, you yeah. know, and yeah. why it's so powerful, why this art form is so damn powerful, because it, it touches you. It reaches you. Yeah, you know, that's true. Yeah, right. I'm like talking about this. Stuff. I'm getting so excited. So yeah, I'm, we're, we're all getting we're getting amped up. <laughs> Let's like go to 7-Eleven and get a we do this for a living. Like we don't have to do this when we get. Like I don't have to do this when I get off this line. Like it's, it's incredible. This is great. Yeah, uh, yeah. Cool. I feel like I'm a kid and I should get like one of those Marvel Slurpee cups. You know, uh, by a by a yeah. comic. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's great. That's great. Well, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Dennis. Uh, I know you're uh, in, in beautiful Hawaii. Yes. It's uh, six hours behind us. So uh, you're in the middle of the day there. You got some sunshine to catch, dude. You can see it. it, it, see it right look, at look at that. <laughs> it's right there, it's here. Watching. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. So uh, I want to uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, uh, thank and, you for inviting me. Uh, it was just great. It was really wonderful. Thank you so, so much. You know, we could we could chat like this easily for another hour, I think. Oh, no so doubt about it. Today. We should do it again. 
Uh, I, I would love that. I, you know, I'd love to have you back. Why not? Yeah. Like, let's, let's do part two. Why not? Why not? Like really, like really put everyone like, they'll be like, oh my God, this guy again. Jeez. <laughs> I don't think so because I'm looking at the chats and Frag is loving it. That's uh, I mean. A lot of people are, are really enjoying the conversation. Right, uh, right. So uh, I, I think we've, uh, we, we, we've touched some souls and that's a good thing, right? That's a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody in the chat, thank you again for for uh, uh, stopping by uh, and, and and listening to uh, us uh, banter and chatter on uh, about a, a passion of ours, uh, comics, and a, a passion of yours, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Next week, I, I I think I don't have a guest lined up, so I think I'm going to be discussing the career of Noel Sickles. Oh, so um, yeah, so see, Dennis will be in. He'll he'll be he'll yeah. be watching that. Yeah. <laughs> genius, genius artist, genius. I, I like to showcase guys that a lot of people don't know. I know you did a Mort Meskin show, right? I did. I did Mort Meskin. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Artist. He's the artist everybody should know and nobody knows. And right. uh, I, I really, really enjoyed that show. Uh, yeah. And and I, I think um, uh, um, uh, I've already forgot his name. <laughs> uh, what did I say next week's show? No sickles, thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh my god, right. I've done Frank Robbins. <laughs> so, <laughs> Frank Robbins is another guy who's just wow. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry, I miss that. Just excellent, yeah. excellent artist. The fir the first show I ever did was it was my favorite favorite cartoonist, um, and that's Roy Crane. Oh wow! Oh wow! The yeah. master. Yeah, the master, the father of adventure strips. Yes, yes, and well, you uh, that, that was a fun show. You know, you know, uh, do you still live? In, do you still live in Queens in New York? No, I live in L.A. now. Oh, you're living in L.A. OK, because I was going to say to you that the uh, the Roy Crane collection is at Syracuse University. Really? Yeah. And okay. you, can, you can go in there and, and you know, call ahead and they'll bring all the stuff out. They've got his scripts, his uh, letters to the Navy, his uh, wow. original artwork and stuff. And you can just hold the stuff. It's it's friggin amazing. I would just. I, they, I'd have, I have trouble. They'd have trouble getting me out of there. So I know. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I walked out of there very square because I had all these artwork under my shirt. <laughs> They're not going to catch me. <laughs> no, no. This is the way I came in. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right, sir. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. And we'll catch you next week. We'll talk.